clock, let's stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, I'll call the meeting to order. Um, Approval of today's agenda. I look for approval. So moved. A second. A second. Okay. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Oppose the same sign. Okay. No action items, so let's move on to our study session. The world's best workforce. Mary Jo and Julie. Come on up. Good evening. Uh, we're here this evening to present to you the world's best workforce and achievement and integration uh, review from last year and the plan moving ahead to um, next year. So, let's see if this works. Or do I turn it actually? There we go. Okay. So, what is world's best workforce? Um, it was a bill that was passed in 2013 to ensure that every school district in the state is making strides to increase student performance. So there's five areas listed in the presentation that we will go through um, that this plan needs to address. Um, this is something that we do post to our district website and turn into the state um, by December 15th of every year. Oh, are you doing it? Okay. All right, so this was our first uh, performance measure for last year uh, where we look at our incoming kindergartners and how they are performing on our FAST assessment. And so we had a goal set of 85% meeting uh, some to low risk in their fall benchmark scores. And our, our target was 85 and they scored right on at 85%. So moving forward, that's a good thing, um, but we want to now unpack what that truly means um, uh, since we have met that goal. So looking ahead, we broke down um, the scores, the high risk to some risk to low risk as FAST um, does for us. And so um, now our target for next year would be to um, increase that low risk number so right now we're at 42%, target for next fall would be at 50% or obviously higher, um, but raising by eight percentage points seemed like a reasonable goal. And so um, how we plan to do that is to um, look at the data. There's four subtests that the incoming kindergartners take. And so really connecting uh, with the early childhood teachers and the kindergarten teachers um, to what those assessments require of students to ensure um, that they are ready uh, for kindergarten. We also have our success coaches that will continue to connect with the uh, families of our youngest learners. And um, we have job embedded professional development um, for our early childhood teachers as well as our kindergarten teachers. Now our next goal has to do with some MCA reporting and so we just want to have this caveat to this year um, with the pandemic and most students in our district did take the MCA but not all of them due to where they were um, the setting that um, they were learning last year and so MDE really emphasizes that we have to um, we use MCA scores as one indicator um, to identify um, how the district um, is doing, um, but not to use it obviously as our sole indicator. So keeping that in mind, our goal 
uh, for last year uh, was to increase the number of proficient students, um, this was third graders, on the reading MCA. And so in 2019, the last time they took the assessment, we were at 43% with 99% participating. They didn't take the assessment in 2020. So last year, 2021, we had a target of 48.1%, um, but our actual result was at 35.7. And so 87, or sorry, 86% participated um, on that assessment. And so taking that into consideration um, as we um, see that number. It, looking ahead, we want to continue our, our target of that 48.1% of using our number from 2019, since they didn't test in 2020, and 2021 was still an odd year, uh, we want to work towards that um, this year in 2022. And then some ways that we will be doing that is to um, continue our use of our explicit phonics instruction, um, that really great reading that I know a lot of you um, saw um, here at a board meeting a year or two ago. We also have our new science resources that allow our teachers to incorporate science concepts into the reading block and vice versa. And it's really purposeful planning, cross-curricular connections that students are able to make. We also have our resource specialists this year that are working to triangulate our MCA data with our FAST data, as well as our really great reading data to uh, really see where kids are at and meet them uh, where they're at to um, help them to succeed. Performance measure number three has to do with closing the achievement gaps among all student groups. And so here on this slide, you'll see the difference in MCA proficiency rates with our comparison group, which is our white students. And so these numbers you, we want to see go down. So I have 2018, 2019 data, and then our target for 2021, and our actual in the blue column for math and for reading. And so some successes there, um, our target uh, Hispanic Latino population for math, we did um, meet that target as well as in our two or more races category of a gap of 11.1 .1 versus our target of 20.2. And then in reading, um, same thing with the two or more races category, um, the actual 5.3 gap versus our target of 8.3. So moving forward, we do, do obviously still have some more work that we need to do. And so um, there you'll see the targets that we've set continuing with that five percentage points that we would like to um, decrease um, this year as well. And so ways that we are going to be working on that is to continue our high reliability schools um, push uh, that buildings have been utilizing. Um, level two has to do with effective teaching in every classroom. And so really working on um, providing teachers with clear ongoing evaluations, um, pedagogy, um, instructional strategies that are consistent with student achievement data um, is going to be a big, big push um, as we move forward this year. All right. Uh, any questions so far? Should we keep going? Do you happen to have any of the state averages for any of these, the data, for example, the third grade reading, how do, how do we compare? Yes. And we will share some of that in our next presentation too. So if that question still um, comes up, let me know. Yep. Is, is there some things when you talk about working on it, some different strategies, is there gonna be some backing up due to COVID last year or is there just some new strategies that are out there now that are recommended to use? I mean, I'm not asking real particular, just some ideas. Yeah, so certainly the learning recovery, you know, nationwide, we've heard about it. And so in elementary, we have, as Julie said, the, da the data to tell us where each student is individually. 
So based on that data, our interventions are matched on where the student's at. So they still get their class-wide instruction, what we call Tier 1, the, the standards for that grade level. And then there might be some class-wide interventions to when we realize what are the pieces of instruction that we need support with. And that's where our resource specialists in the buildings are really helping. They've dove into the data. They're helping um, the data team in each grade level, helping with the interventions, looking at what is it we need to do as part of our learning recovery plan. So, yes, that's daily discussions in buildings, and um, it's good work. You know, at a secondary level, um, same thing. We have data that we have to look at. Um, well, we have fast data up until ninth grade for certain students, but data gets a little trickier there of what what was missed. So there it's really, if any students failed those classes, um, concerning. So, you know, um, Chris Doubles here could speak more about it, but one of the offerings we're doing during the high school day is credit recovery because students who have quite a few classes maybe to make up because they didn't pass and they're required for graduation are in a guided study hall doing credit recovery as well as after school. So we're really pushing to make sure kids are on track for graduation. Um, so the fourth goal, and, and all these goals are, or all the measures, the performance measures, all five of them are determined by MDE. So the, what Julie has started sharing is MDE wants to know what is our plan for these performance measures. So I'm going to talk about all students are ready for college, for, are ready for a career in college. And what you're looking at is the ACT score. So that's the goal that we have set in World's Best Workforce as, as a tool to um, gauge how are students doing for, for this measurement. So in 2019, we had 204 students take the ACT. And then the four subtests, English, math, reading, science, you can see how the 2019 juniors would have scored on the ACT. The next year where was a COVID year, so ACT was not given. Then last year, no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm off. Yes. No, you're right. Yeah. The, so the seniors would have taken the, the first blue column there, the seniors 2020. They really, if it had been a normal year, they would have taken the ACT test in the spring of 2020. But instead, they were given it in the fall of 2020 due to COVID. This was nationwide. And you can see what our targets were that we had, we kept the same targets and where the seniors had scored. Now again, they took it um, after a COVID year. And then in September, the end of September is when they, they took this. So, you know, when you look at those scores, yep, we didn't meet it, well, we, we met what we had for a reading for that target, but you can see that definitely impacted. Then the juniors, so we gave two ACT tests last year, again, unusual. The juniors then took it last spring, and um, they exceeded every target we had set prior in the world's best workforce. And I think a couple of things going on there. One is you can see that 136 students took it who, because of the work that the high school has been doing, has focused kids on what does post-secondary look like for you? Is it college? Is it career, the workforce, et cetera? And so 136 students said, college bound, ACT is what I should be taking. So those are the students who took the test. Those who may be heading to a Minsky school work, um, you know, Riverland's part of Minsky, but would take the AccuPlacer. And then those students who know, I'm headed to the military after uh, high school, then there's an assessment called the ASVAB. So it was really the counselors working with students on what is the appropriate assessment for you for your post-secondary life. And um, so every subtest was, you know, exceeded here. And so as we continue on and planning for 
this year's world's best workforce, we're basing it off of this year's scores or the slash uh, spring scores, and then increased, you know, what we consider a smart goal of, well, let's go 5%. So the target for this year's junior class is the blue um, column, increasing the ACT percentage in each subtest area. And then the last measurement is that um, all students graduate from high school. And with no individual uh, racial or ethnic group following below 85%. And so you can see the columns of the history there. And then if you go to 2020, the end column, you know, our target is, like I said, 85%. So we did not meet 85%, um, came close in the white, but you can see we have some work in, you know, the, the Hispanic um, area as well as um, free and reduced, which we continue to work on, and then special education. But um, nice to see that, that the percentages continue to increase, which is a positive. Am I doing, I'm doing this one too, right? Yep. Um, and so then the, as we talk about the individual ethnic groups, you can see, sorry, why is my not matching? Right, you're right. Okay. We're just continuing our goal of 85% um, for each of oh, our Oh, for this year's groups. plan, yes. Yep. Okay. All of a sudden, I'm like, did I just say this? Yes, sorry. Um, so, yes, so now we have the 2021 target in every group there of 85%. Questions about World's Best Workforce. So in the target groups for graduation, um, you know, overall it's just short of 5% growth, but what some of the, the groups that have the larger gaps, what are the interventions or the supports that um, that they will receive to, to make that extra leap to 85? So we have utilized Naviance in the high school and to help students make four-year um, career or um, post-secondary path of how they are going to achieve their goals and what that looks like after graduation. Um, we have our special education case managers um, working with the school counselors um, to ensure that students and families are working um, to keep students on track to graduate. Um, we have our success coaches working with our, um, our diverse populations. We have our multilingual teachers um, working with our students who speak um, a language other than English um, to really um, support them whether they graduate in the four years or potentially the seven years based on when they um, started school um, in the United States or in Albert Lee. And then um, our counselors that meet with our students um, to ensure that they are keeping on track as well. And then offering the credit recovery during the day as well now I think will be a big, big support to all students to support them any way we can to make sure they're meeting the grad credits and on track. Maybe you said this already, but how often is performance measured for World's Best Workforce? Is it once a year or twice a year? Once? Okay. Every, Every year. year. Yep. What percent of students are non-white? I don't think we have it exactly in this presentation, Mike, but... I think it's 59% of our students are white. All right, so then moving forward, talking about our achievement and integration plan. Um, this plan has three goals and we are um, able to set the goals that we are working towards. And so our first goal has to do with um, academics and again, the proficiency gap. 
Here we are looking at our free and reduced population versus our non-free and reduced lunch um, population. And so this plan um, is a three-year plan. So it started in 2018-2019 school year, and so we had a gap or a disparity um, between the two subgroups of 27.7%. 2019-2020, uh, they did not take the uh, reading accountability test, so we didn't um, have the score that year. So for this year, this last MCA round of 2020-2021, um, we are making um, adequate progress in that our gap has decreased to 22%. So we're going to continue as we do with the three-year plan of working towards our target of 18.7%. And just um, a reminder, the Achievement and Integration Grant, the sole purpose for this grant is to decrease the racial and economic uh, disparity in, our, in, the, or in the district. Um, so then goal two is... Uh, how are we going to train educators, et cetera, to be culturally responsive, have the leadership? And so the last several years, we've done cultural competency training, just learning about the different cultures. So if, if you have current students in your class, you understand the, the, the culture of the, Esther could speak highly, you know, a lot of, of this, but of Corinne, right? Oh, my gosh, Esther, I'm sorry. Um, boy, that's a big mistake on my part. Um, but making sure we understand the cultures and the backgrounds of the students we serve. And so our success coaches who are Spanish, Corinne, and Nuir do a lot of the training with staff, working with staff, a lot of one-on-one -on -one, um, support with students and families just need it throughout the year to make sure we're um, supporting all of our students. And so we have... Um, we'll continue to do that as part of our plan. And then goal three is the, the number of non-white students that are enrolling in early college courses will increase from 8% to 9.5%. So um, you can see the actual uh, students in 2019-20 was 21% uh, and then non-white was 8%. And so decreased last year uh, with COVID, 15 and 7% across the board in, in both categories. And so we want to um, increase more students, non-white students, participating in early college classes for this coming year to 9%, and then the following year to 9.5%. And that is the Achievement and Integration uh, grant and goal that we'll send along with the world's best workforce. And it's just part of the MDE um, reporting that we do. So Julie and Mary, are some of those same strategies the same for to get to these targets with your success coaches and, and things like that to help with this part? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Very cool. Um, it goes without saying that uh, that the district is working really hard to to uh, obtain a staff that represents the the uh, number of students that we have that are non-white. I'm quite certain we don't have 40% of our staff that are non-white. It would be a really great problem to have if we had to have cultural instruction for our staff so that they could understand white culture. That is, if we had, you know, a preponderance of non-white uh, staff. And I, I, I think our success coaches probably are f of the non-white variety. Uh, if we could get classroom teachers that were of that same uh, variety. Uh, and I know, we, and I know every, every, every uh, school in the nation is working on that. Uh, it's just they're, just, they're just not out there. But uh, I, I just want to make that comment that uh, I think our, 
our problems would be a lot simpler if we had a staff that reflected the the uh, the ratio of non-white students that we have in the district. Agreed. Four point two. Then is that correct? Without any yes. other questions. Okay. Same two. Go ahead. All right, so we're starting um, just the, the overview of all the data from last year. And again, this is a pathways goals set by the school board. And no changes have been on that, but we always start with what the pathway goals are. And then the free and reduce, reduced lunch count for uh, last year has decreased, but again, families, meals were free to all families last year. So the incentive necessarily wasn't there for, you know, we encourage families to still fill out the um, freed reduce form, but um, not sure if that happened or not, but our free and reduce count did go down for the district, so. And then this next slide just talks again about our balanced assessment systems and how at the top of the triangle is the state assessment, so the MCA, and then we have our district assessments that we give as well as our classroom assessments. And so really taking into account that the MCA is a snapshot of where students were at on that particular day and how this year we're really triangulating our data um, within the district and our classrooms um, to meet students where they are at because of what has happened in the last year and a half. And the next slide just goes, is a, a slide from MDE, um, just talking again about um, one piece to the puzzle, the MCA results. So with that, then we go into our math academic achievement. So this is the math MCA that's given to third graders through eighth grade as well as our 11th graders. And so on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see um, the statewide meet or exceeds percentages. And at the bottom is the Albert Lee um, percentages. And so taking a look, um, obviously across the board, the state um, decreased as well as we did. Um, if you look, if you compare, say, 2018 to 2021, um, the state decreased by about 13%, whereas we um, decreased about 17%. Um, and then taking a look at the far right-hand side of the, the percent of students who participated. So we had the high 80% um, almost 90% every year take this assessment, and last year simply just 72% were assessed. Reading, same look here. Um, the state from 2018 till about 2021 um, decreased by about 7 percentage points, and we decreased by about 11 percentage points. Again, um, the same thing happened. We went from the almost 90% of students participating to 74% participating in the reading assessments. The reading test is given to third through eighth grade as well as 10th grade students. They, like yeah. 20 percent I believe yeah. and they and they do um, it depends on what's on their IEP but a majority of them do take the MCA um, if they haven't opted out there is the MTAS option which um, are uh, which is uh, another version of the MCA for our students that aren't able to um, do the paper pencil um, reading uh, writing assessment
on. Yeah. Are we still um, among the the, the uh, uh, top uh, schools in the state that have students that opt out of the MCA tests? I mean, I, I would think that would have a significant impact on on the percentages that are displayed here. I mean, I think that was a discussion throughout the state last year. I don't know if we can compare um, this last year to what has happened previously, just because of the different learning models that were happening. Um, however, yes, I mean, that is, you know, a significant decrease in participation. And so we do continue to um, look at that. But yes, assessment coordinators throughout the state are, I mean, just going into testing season last year was how are we going to to do this and making make sure that if we are giving this assessment that it's worthwhile to um, that we are still able to use the data that we get from it um, and so that's where we really look on an individual basis and the buildings principals and the data teams and the buildings are looking at students progress versus comparing district-wide, the whole school, whole grade level, it's really looking at, you know, a student by student um, basis to see what needs they um, need based on multiple data points. And it appears um, from the percentage taking tests statewide in Albert Lee that this year we actually were more in line with the state statewide opt-out compared to other years. Sure. And this, um, these are for which grade? So now this slide I haven't spoke about yet. So this one is science. So, but did you want to know about math and reading? Yep. So math is given to third through eighth grade okay. and 11th graders. And then the reading assessment is given third through eighth and 10th grade. So all correct. Math. Correct. And so now science is on the screen here, and that is through fifth grade, eighth grade, and 10th graders take the science MCA. And so um, here we didn't um, necessarily have as significant of a drop. Um, if you would compare 2019 to 2021, um, it was about a 6% decrease. Um, on the left hand side and are about a 6% decrease in participation as well. All right, this next slide is for the access test, which is a, the assessment, annual assessment giving, given to our um, English language uh, learners. And so it compares the state to Albert Lee and the level um, the students are at. So you can see in Albert Lee, um, we have a higher level of, of students who are at level one than, than the um, state. And you can just kind of read across. And level four is where a student will exit EL after they've reached that level. And so five and six is why there's very little percentage there, but um, they did not measure growth last year, um, so we don't have the growth numbers. So, so Mary Jo, define for the board what each level one looks like as opposed to like a level four. A level one would be um, somebody new to country, very beginning uh, English language proficiency, level two, so level two is moving into that conversational level. Level three and four are continuing getting closer to English proficiency. When a student reaches a level four, then they're considered um, proficient and are no longer requiring EL programming in the district. And the, the four subtests to determine that students are tested on is how well they read in English, listening, uh, writing, and then speaking. And so it's a standardized national assessment, and um, we get this. We get the test in about February, and normally we get the results before school's out. But this year it was June; just COVID changed a lot of things. 
So it just shows that, um, you know, in Albert Lee, we do have a lot of beginning English language learners and um, a lot of, uh, you know, high number of level three students. And then the, the graph on the right is just, it's a proficiency graph that the state puts out on how many students were actually proficient when they tested on the access test. So um, you can see in Albert Lee, we had 3% who tested out of EL programming last year and st statewide it was 8.6%. Uh, This next graph is um, it's just consistent attendance, students who are um, looking at attendance across, and you can see in the state, we're just slightly below the state average at 85%. In Albert Lee, we're at 82.9. And then the right is the demographics of how many in the demographic areas, how many have consistent attendance. So you can see where, um, above the state in some areas and below the state in other demographic areas. But again, this is where we'll do the interventions or have support from success coaches, school counselors, um, this year resource specialists, working with families to figure out what are the barriers that students don't have consistent attendance in school. And then the last one was our advanced placement results from last spring. So we had 138 students participate in AP classes. And um, you can, I should explain this graph here. So 138 students, of sc the numbers across the top are just the scores that you can uh, receive on an AP test, a score of one, two, three, four, five. Um, most colleges will take a three, but all colleges will take a four or a five. So if a student's scoring um, in the one or two range, they're most likely not receiving college credit for that AP class that they took. Um, you can see how many exams were given and the scores. And then the breakdown of where the AP students were and the, the scores that they received. And then just in the bottom of the list of the subjects that students can take AP classes at Albert Lee High School with. And um, just for prior year reference, we had 121 students participate. And in 2020 and in 2021, we had 138. Any questions? When it comes to some of the differences, you know, in the numbers between here and the state, whether it's graduation rates or uh, proficiency rates, what are the biggest factors that are affecting us? Is it some of the things we mentioned, like special ed and English lear learners, or are there other things too? Economics. Okay. Would those be the top three reasons, probably? Okay. One of the things that we have going against us when we're looking at data, such as like four-year graduation rate, our English learner students can be here for what, till 21? Seven years. Seven years, okay. Same thing with our special education students. So if they're receiving special education services, they can go till um, through 21. And so um, it, we've made great progress in both of those areas as a district, but at the same time, you know, yeah, we want our kids graduating in four years, but we have to take a look at what's in the best interest of the student. Is it to graduate in four years or is it to be prepared when they, when they uh, graduate? So that's so, a factor. Yeah, well. so we try and work with families. So if you're, um, you know, coming from another country or, or wherever, it, and English is a big, Eng you have a lot of English language to learn yet. You're not just proficient in the language. You know, depending on what grade you come in, if, if you're coming in kindergarten or first grade, most English language learners can exit EL programming at a younger age faster. 
so they can, most of our early elementary students, when they start in EL programming, they'll exit by fifth, sixth, maybe seventh grade. Now you have to think of it, if you are, say, an eighth grader coming, and it takes about five years, six years, seven years for English language proficiency, on top of all the graduation credits. So we try and work with families to, to say this may not happen in four years, and this is what our school counselors do, but to put plans in place to ensure that we do get students to graduate because we do feel that's important. And so some families maybe have a five-year plan or a six-year plan, and we say, that's okay. We're getting your student ready for adults or, you know, for adulthood. And in the U.S., you know, we have 13 years of a formalized education system. And so it's hard to make that up if you come as a, as a secondary student. So if students graduate late, they're not counted in the graduation number? Okay. They they're not counted it. as graduating uh, four years. MDE does now give us the five, six, and seven-year graduation okay. rate. And when they release the new graduation rates um, each year, that's when we'll bring that data and dive in deeper to what six, you know, a five and six, seven year graduation rate is. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the uh, annual number report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a. Uh, couple of announcements. Uh, tomorrow's vote, please vote everyone. And the uh, vote results will be uh, tabbed up at the courthouse after 8 p.m. tomorrow night. Uh, next Tuesday, the 9th at 7 a.m., we'll have a special meeting to canvas all the votes will be here. And then on Monday the 15th will be our um, business meeting for the school district. And uh, this is one other note, I'll just say this a little bit early, but December 6th is our truth and taxation hearing following the uh, special meeting. So without that, thank you for coming tonight. Please adjourn.